Olá pessoal, bom dia a todos. Sejam muito bem-vindos à Semana da Saúde da Unicef. Hoje nós estamos aí no terceiro dia de programação, nosso terceiro dia do evento. E hoje nós vamos abordar um tema muito relevante, muito interessante, que é o pé diabético, tanto no sentido da avaliação quanto no sentido do tratamento. E para isso nós temos um convidado muito especial, que é o nosso aluno de pós-doutorado em Ciências da Reabilitação, o Dr. Sampa. Então, só para a gente contextualizar, é... Hello Sampa, good morning. Good morning, então, só... good morning. É, então, só para eu apresentar a vocês, né, como, eu, como eu disse anteriormente, o, o Sampa, ele é o nosso aluno de pós-doc, o Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciências da Reabilitação, ele teve início em 2009 com o programa de mestrado, né? foi recomendado pela TAPES em 2009. E em 2015, nós tivemos o início do doutorado, mas um pouquinho antes, em 2014, nós começamos a receber os nossos primeiros pesquisadores de pós-doutorado. Então, atualmente, o Sampa é um dos nossos pesquisadores internacionais, o Sampa, ele é indiano, atualmente ele atua numa universidade dos Emirados Árabes e ele trabalha com, com diabetes e eu tenho a oportunidade de ser a supervisora dele é, nesse projeto. Então, como parte da, das suas atividades como pesquisador de pós-doc, o Sampa realiza palestras sistemáticas para os nossos alunos de mestrado, doutorado e também para os nossos outros pesquisadores de pós-doutorado. E aproveitando né, a nossa ocasião da Semana da Saúde, esse mês em especial, essa palestra está sendo então, aberta a, a todos vocês, né, que o é, professor Arthur, nosso coordenador, acabou de aparecer aqui dando... <risos> saudando o professor Sampa, então o professor Arthur é o nosso, é o coordenador do programa de pós-graduação em ciências da reabilitação. Então, é, a nossa palestra, ela vai ser ministrada em, em inglês, como é, uma vez que é, a, a, muitas das nossas atividades também são conduzidas né, em inglês, é uma maneira da gente estimular também que os nossos alunos é, façam é, parcerias internacionais, nós acabamos de ter um aluno nosso aprovado com a Bolsa Sanduíche pela CAPES, então em breve ele estará é, estudando numa universidade na Austrália, né, o Gustavo orientado, orientado pelo professor Leandro. É, enfim, então mostrando a internacionalização do programa, uma maior visibilidade do nosso programa, destacando que ele é o único em ciências da reabilitação, da reputação no, no estado do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, bom, o Sampa vai fazer a palestra dele, vai iniciar em alguns minutos. Se vocês tiverem alguma pergunta, basta colocar aqui nos comentários que, é, ao final, eu, eu faço essas perguntas. Quem tiver mais, uh, quem quiser, na verdade, mais informações sobre os nossos programas, de mestrado, doutorado e pós-doutorado em ciências da reabilitação, os links vão estar aqui na descrição. Uh, e nós temos também outro programa em desenvolvimento local, né, que também tem mestrado, doutorado e pós-doutorado, e quem tiver interesse também pode entrar nesses links para ter mais informações. Bom, então a partir de agora eu vou falar em inglês com o Sampa. Sou o Sampa. Good morning. Good morning. <risos> Welcome to the third day of Unisuan's Healthy Week. Today we'll talk about diabetes, which, yes. which is a chronic disease that affects millions of people in all the world, including children, adults, the elderly. We know that it's a global emergency, it's a global challenge here in Brazil. Yes. The prevalence of diabetes is about 8% to 90% which means that we are the fourth country in the world in cases of diabetes. So, we, uh, we, we know that diabetes is, is associated with cardiovascular disease, mortality, 
So we have to give our hands <laughs> to prevent and treat diabetes, no? Uh, as I, I said to, to, to the students and to people that are watching us, Sampa is our postdoctorate researcher. Now he is that he's he's teaching in in Youth Medical University as he Emirates Arabic. He's bachelor in physiotherapy, master in physiotherapy, and doctor in philosophy. Now he's studying exercise training effects in type 2 diabetes. We are very excited about uh, this project and uh, today we'll talk we'll talk about assessment and measurement of diabetic food. Sampa, thank you yeah. for thank sharing you. your time with us. Thank it's you. a big pleasure to have you here. Sure. Okay. So I, I uh, I'm for uh, I just uh, in order to have the smooth session uh, because there is an internet connectivity issue so I would like to uh, disable my uh, video cam with your permission yeah. okay. is my screen is visible not yet yes yeah yeah. Okay, so at this outside, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Patricia and uh, Dr. Arthur for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today, my topic uh, will be on the assessment and management of diabetic food. Uh, actually, uh, this is a diabetic food which usually is concerned with the medical practitioners and the surgeons and endocrinologists. But as a physiotherapist, today we I am going to discuss a few aspects on the assessment and management. So these are my contents for the presentation. So moving on to the introduction, according to the American Diabetic Association, this diabetes is defined as a group of uh, metabolic disorders, which is characterized by a chronic hyperglycemia, which is associated with disturbances of carbohydrates, fat, and protein metabolism, which is due to the absolute or relative insulin deficiency secretion or action. So the classification of this diabetes mellitus is further classified into the type 1 type uh, diabetes mellitus, type 2 diabetes mellitus, gestational diabetes mellitus, and other specific types which includes maturity onset young adults in diabetes and also the steroid induced diabetes mellitus. So the diagnostic criteria for diabetes was given by the various organizations, but most commonly the World Health Organization, American Diabetic Association and International Diabetes Federation uh, have given a cutoff criteria to diagnose this diabetes. So the person with the fasting blood sugar levels more than 126 mg per deciliter and two hours post plasma glucose that is more than 200, 200 mg per deciliter is considered to be a diabetic patient. Whereas the person with impaired glucose tolerance levels of the fasting blood sugar levels, which is less than 126 mg per deciliter and the two hours plasma glucose that is more than 140 mg per deciliter to less than 200 mg per deciliter is considered to be the impaired glucose tolerance stage. Whereas the impaired fasting glucose in which the fasting blood sugar levels are ranging from 110 mg per deciliter to the 125 mg per deciliter. Whereas the oral glucose that is the two hours plasma glucose that is less than 140 mg per deciliter. Apart from this, we have uh, another uh, parameter, important parameter that is called as the HbA1c is nothing but the glycated hemoglobin. If the value, the normal value of this glycated hemoglobin will be less than 5.7. If the range is between the 5.7 to less than 6.5, so this state is considered to be the pre-diabetic stage. That means the person is about to start with the diabetes problem. If the value of HbA1c is more than 6.5, then the person is thought to be is a diabetic. So this glycated hemoglobin will be given as the average sugar levels in the last three to four months. 
so we have various complications of diabetes mellitus among them we have uh, it is classified into the acute and the long term complications whereas acute complications will be the hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia whereas the long term complications of this diabetes mellitus are categorized into the macro vessel or the macrovascular and the micro vessel or the microvascular so in microvascular complications usually this diabetic affects entire almost all the major organs of the body so among them the retinopathy that is the it is affected the eyes that is the diabetic retinopathy and if kidneys are involved that is the diabetic nephropathy and the peripheral nerves are involved that is diabetic neuropathy whereas in the microvascular complications mainly it is targeting the coronary artery disease peripheral arterial disease stroke and often leads to the diabetic foot infection or ulcerations so the diabetic foot by the definition given by the american diabetes association it is mainly the diabetic foot which is present in the anatomical area below the malleoli in a person with diabetes mellitus whereas this it is a diabetic foot is a group of syndromes in which neuropathy ischemia and infection leading to the tissue breakdown and resulting in morbidity and later stages it might lead to the amputation of the involved limb so the lifetime risk of a person with diabetes developing the foot ulceration is high as 25% of the chances and whereas in older persons up to 50% are said to be having the risk factors to develop this diabetic foot ulcers so these diabetic foot ulcers are further stratified uh, based on the level of the risk so mainly it is ranging from the low risk foot to the ulcerated foot uh, in the low risk there will be a risk category is completely zero but the, there is a chance of developing the diabetic foot whereas the risk category 1 or increased risk foot risk category 2 or high risk foot and whereas risk category 3 or ulcerated foot this put further uh, we have many classifications and further this diabetic foot risk classification this is one more classification where the risk group zero mainly the patients will not have the there is no loss of protective sensation with no peripheral arterial disease involvement whereas in the risk group one there is a loss of protective sensation with or without deformity and whereas risk group two that patients with peripheral arterial disease without without the loss of protective sensation and whereas the risk group 3 there will be a history of ulcer or previous amputation of the patients so we have the staging of this diabetic foot in this pictures you can see uh, at the various uh, stages the foot ulcers are being developed in the stage 1 that is a normal foot and whereas in the stage 2 that is it is a high risk the patient tends to start developing the foot ulceration changes in terms of the musculoskeletal or the skin or any other changes whereas the stage 3 it's already been ulcerated and there is a open wounds as in the stage 4 this is a cellulitic stage where you can see in the picture this is a in uh, dark uh, red pigmentation changes can be seen that is because of the presence of the cellular and inflammatory changes whereas the stage 5 it is a necrotic uh, stage and there are stage 6 ultimately the patient will land up in the amputation of the involved ulcerated segment so if you see the epidemiology globally according to the international diabetes federation in the year 2019 the prevalence of this type 2 diabetes mellitus was 9.3% whereas which is expected to rise to the 10.9% by the year 2045 so if you see globally there is a tremendous increase in the prevalence of this diabetes mellitus in across the globe so in these are the top 10 countries uh, list where the china is being in the year 2019 china is ranked number 1 and whereas by the year 2045 the china will be ranking the number one in this type 2 diabetes mellitus whereas if you see the statistics of the brazil in the year 2019 there are 16.8 million people are developed uh, develop the diabetes whereas this is projected to increase to the 26 million people by the year 2045 in a prevalence study uh, done by uh, the doctor david armstrong 
they have found that the annually the foot ulcers develop in 9.1 million people to the 26.1 million people across the worldwide so this prevalence is ranging from as low as 1.8 percent in south asians who are living in the united kingdom and to the 11.8 percent who are residing in the us this complications of diabetes were high with prevalence of the neuropathy that is the highest is 24.6 percentage of the diabetic populations are developing the neuropathy whereas the 23.6 patients have been developed the cardiovascular changes and whereas the 21 percent are developing the renal complications whereas 16.6 percent are developing the eye complications and 5.1 percent of the patients are developing foot ulcers so this is a tertiary study which is done uh, on the pooling of the five uh, various uh, different locations across the globe and the odds ratio you can see in this the uh, there are various risk factors among this the most common is one is the vibration perception threshold that is a more than 25 volts this vpt uh, is said to be one of the important key as assessment and the diagnostic criteria for the patients with diabetes neuropathy So the sequence of events which are happening in this diabetic foot mainly because of the presence of hyperglycemia and there will be a functional changes happens which are reversible and along with the other secondary factors like other comorbid conditions with uh, this patients will develop an early, early structural changes which are leading to the progressive irreversible uh, tissue damage and finally they are landing up with the end stage disease. So this diagram was talks about the path of this diabetic foot ulcer where this diabetes mellitus has been categorized and discussed into the motor neuropathy, sensory neuropathy and autonomic neuropathy. Because of this uh, various involvement of this, there will be leading to the foot ulcer in later stages. So neuropathy, ischemia and infection, all these three clinical triad constitutes the diabetic foot. So now we will be discussing about the pathogenesis of the diabetic foot problems. We uh, need to be, there are the peripheral vascular disease involvement, neuropathy, biomechanical aspects of the diabetic foot problems, other long term complications, any previous history of the foot ulcers the diabetes duration and control, whereas the behavioral and psychological factors and wound healing. So to start with the peripheral vascular diseases, mainly the atherosclerosis is the main complication in the patients with the long-term diabetes. These patients with the atherosclerosis will develop the endothelial damage and they will develop the platelet aggregation, which further leads to the development of the lipid deposition and it leads to the plaque formation in the later stages. Whereas in this uh, peripheral vascular disease, usually the frequent involvement of the vessels are always below the knee. And also because of this, there is also a reduced ability to develop the collateral blood supply in the involved extremities. And this ischemia is one of the major factor which is resulting in the ulcer, but a minor trauma can be also a triggering factor. So whenever a patient with diabetes develops an injury, it will be an increased demand on circulation, which cannot be met because of the tissue damage and which is further leading to the ischemic ulceration and simultaneously at the end, this the patient might need to go for an amputation. Now, the diabetic neuropathy is one of the complications which is divided into the sensory and the motor component. In patients with the sensory uh, this involvement, there will be a reduced or absent sensation to the painful thermal and vibration modalities. Whereas in the motor component involves mainly the smaller muscles, wastage will be seen, which is leading to the muscle imbalance in the flexor and extensor muscles. And ultimately in the foot, if you see, there will be a clawing of the toes and the prominence of metatarsal heads. In the autonomic neuropathy, because of the sympathetic dysfunction in these patients, there will be a reduction in the sweating and also the increase in the blood flow, which will further leads to the development of the dry skin and also the arterial venous shunting develop. This warm foot always uh, have a uh, 
we can sense it as a footfall sense for the severity of the disease which can prone in this the patient may prone to develop the cracks and fissures and markedly reduced toe pressure see this neuropathy foot uh, usually does not ulcerate spontaneously but it always involves in the combination of the neuropathy and the trauma and this trauma could be mainly by the intrinsic factor or the extrinsic factor the extrinsic factor could be because of the improper ill fitting shoes whereas in the intrinsic factor could be because of mainly a repeated constant pressure on the metatarsal heads during the patient's walking pattern which results in the tissue breakdown now if you see the biomechanical aspects the mainly the ulcer is mainly developed because of the elevated plantar pressures in patients with this diabetic foot issues so there are various uh, factors which are responsible for development of this elevated plantar pressures mainly presence of the callus or any alteration in the foot shape that is mainly developing the prominent metatarsal heads and also there is a muscle imbalance and the clawing of toes deformity and there is a limited joint mobility all these factors are leading to the development of this elevated plantar pressures which finally leading into the ulceration and the other long term complications mainly patients with neuro nephropathy and retinopathy have been shown to have an increased foot ulcer and amputation mechanism exactly it is not clear but the visual impairment makes it very difficult for the patients to identify a lesion at the early stages and the tissue repair is slow in cases of the neuropathy because of the due to the presence of the pedal edema in the patients with this diaphragmatic nephropathy and also the one of the main important pathogens is, is the history of any previous ulceration in these diabetes patients the foot ulceration is more common in patients with the past history of ulceration or amputation and in this patients with poor social background are also at risk of developing the one more ulcer at the other extremities the other uh, pathogens is a mainly the diabetes duration and the control mainly the patients they will be having uh, increased levels of this blood glucose but sometimes they tend to neglect because of this poor glycemic control they will develop the complications and strongly it can be a predictive of the subsequent amputation and the behavioral and psychological factors mainly the pain patients with this uh, diabetes there will be a denial and negative attitude towards the feed uh, it could be because of the lower belief in the efficacy of the advices and food care educations if you see the person uh, patients who are living in the rural areas they are tend to having their own traditional customs which they do not allow this external food care or the food devices to be using in their routine clinical day life the next one is the wound healing in this the slow wound healing and increased susceptibility to infection increases the problems of the foot ulcerations and may it can dispose predispose to the amputation there is a inherent immunological abnormalities like especially the tumor growth factor beta 1 and also the delayed tissue uh, response to the trauma in this wound healing mainly there is a increased capillary fragility in neuropathic foot with the history of the foot ulcerations so this table depicts the foot complications in diabetes ranging from the peripheral neuropathy peripheral vascular diseases which accounts mostly the 20 to 40% of the patients with diabetes whereas the foot ulceration is seen in the 5.5% of the patients in per year and whereas the foot infection and in osteomyelitis is ranging from 22 to 66% of the foot ulcers and amputation 0.5% of the patients with diabetes per year and the whereas one more important uh, deformity foot deformity that is a charcot's neuroarthropathy where it is seen the 0.1 to 0.4% of the patients with diabetes per year so the diabetic foot ulcers mainly the causes of this foot ulcers could be because of the peripheral neuropathy peripheral vascular disease biomechanical changes hemorrhology and the infection the more than 60% of the diabetic foot ulcers are a result of an underlying neuropathy and the peripheral arterial disease is a contributing factor to this diabetic foot ulcers in 50% of the cases in people with the diabetes 
So the peripheral neuropathy, which is the most common long-term complications in diabetes, whereas the sensory neuropathy, motor neuropathy, and autonomic neuropathy are the three major components of this peripheral neuropathy, which act conjointly on initiation and perpetuation of the diabetic foot ulcers. In these patients, early screening is always advisable to avoid the future amputations. So the mainly the classification neuropathy mainly by the autonomic neuropathy, sensory neuropathy and motor neuropathy. In autonomic neuropathy, patients will present with the reduced sweating and the vascular issues, whereas in the sensory, uh, there will be patient is presenting with a painless trauma and there will be a musculoskeletal bony changes will be seen. And whereas in the motor component, the muscle atrophy will be present. So all these factors are leading to the development of the abnormal pressure points and the callus formations and ultimately leading to the foot ulcers and leading to the infection. So the biochemical aspects mainly, if you see the glycosylation of the collagen fibers will lead to the development of the increase of the thickening and the cross-linking of the collagen fibers. Therefore, this at the level of the subtalar joints, there will be a restriction of the joint range of motion, which alters the mechanism of walking in this patient population, which are leading to the development of this elevated plantar pressures. Whereas this hemorrhology mainly of the changes, these uh, macrovascular and the microvascular are the changes which is happening because of the presence of this ischemic process due to the structural changes of the large and small blood vessels. Whereas the infection, in this uh, mainly a normal person usually responds to infection by increasing the blood supply to the side. But whereas the blood supply has to be increased to 12 to 15 times to maintain the viability of the skin. If this increase in demand not met the screen, uh, the skin will get breaks down and tissue necrosis results. So this frequent and severe infection is facilitated by the vascular insufficiency. Whereas the necrotized tissue is a good uh, nidus for the organisms to thrive and develop more and multiply. See this, most of the infections are caused by the multiple organisms, but among them, the bacterials are the more common in developing this infection. Next one is the peripheral vascular disease, which is very often the multi-segmental and bilateral involvement. The collateral vessels are also involved and uh, mainly this peripheral vascular disease are presenting with the uh, patients present with the intermittent claudication pain, nocturnal pain and even sometimes a pain at rest. So failure of the intervention at this stage are resulting in the tissue necrosis and the development of gangrene, which is requiring a amputation. So this diabetic foot ulcers are further classified into the based on the etiology that is the neuropathic foot and the neuroischemic foot. This neuropathic foot with this infection and without infection, whereas the neuroischemic foot with infection and without infection. In neuropathic foot, mainly the neuropathy is very dominant uh, in nature, and whereas in the neuroischemic, the occult vascular disease is more dominant. So the clinical differentiation between the neuropathic foot and the ischemic foot on based on the parameters. If you see the skin temperature on the neuropathic foot as a warm and whereas in the neuro ischemic foot is cold. The pain presented by the patient is painless in the neuropathic foot and whereas it is painful in the ischemic foot. The skin color is not altered in the neuropathic foot whereas the development of dependent rubber is in the ischemic foot. The callus at a very thick callus is seen at the main pressure points and in the ischemic foot it may or may not be present whereas the main classical feature of the ulcer that is in the neuropathic foot there will be a plantar at the pressure points and dorsal areas at the of stress whereas in the ischemic foot the ulcer will develop at the margins of the toe and the peripheral pulses are bounding in the uh, neuropathic foot and sometimes it is not palpable or very weak and that is feeble in the neuro ischemic foot and whereas we have the ankle brachial index uh, in neuropathic foot, which is usually the level more than 0.9. And whereas in the ischemic foot, it is uh, the values less than 0.9. So any one of this uh, same characteristic features which are presenting in the patient has to be addressed immediately to the specialist. 
you can see the difference between the neuropathic foot ulcer on the dorsum and whereas neuropath neuro ischemic ulcer on the borders of the extremity of the limb we have a different classifications to name wagner classification and texas classification but among most in the clinical routine clinical practice the most widely used is the wagner classification for classification of this diabetic foot ulcers it is ranging from the grade 0 to grade 5 in grade 0 there will be no ulceration but it is a high risk foot whereas in the grade 1 there will be a superficial ulceration is seen that is a slowly the development of ulcer is starting Whereas in the grade two, that is a deep ulceration that penetrates to the tendon, bone, or the exposure of the joint. Whereas in the grade three, there will be a development of the osteomyelitis of the T axis. And whereas in the grade four, a localized gangrene is being seen. And grade five, that is extensive gangrene, which is requiring the amputation. In such situations, either foot or the it goes to the higher level of the amputation. So now we will focus on the examination of the diabetic feet. We have mainly the screening procedure should be quantifiable, reproducible, predictive and inexpensive. And mainly the history of diabetes mellitus has to be noted and any other previous history of the complications related to the diabetes mellitus and the personal history of the patient. The screening includes mainly the inspection of the foot, the palpation of the foot, examination of the footwear, neurological assessment, vascular assessment, musculoskeletal assessment, and testing for the high pressure points. On, upon inspection in the diabetic patients, mainly we have to insist the patient to remove of the shoes or socks whenever he visits to the uh, therapist or to the physician, and it should be done at every clinical visit and the careful attention should be given especially at the interdigital spaces because in because of the changes in the uh, bony changes in these patients there will be a presence or development of the infection in between the interdigital spaces and if it is neglected sometime it can lead to the development of the ulcer whereas we have to look for the neuropathic changes, especially presence of the dry skin, any presence of fissures or deformities, uh, especially hallux valgus uh, deformity, uh, that, is a, that is also called as a bunion. Uh, presence of callus, abnormal shape of the foot, any uh, active ulcers, the prominent any veins, and any nail lesions. Usually the nail fungus is very commonly seen in the neuropathy patients. And look for ischemic signs that is uh, always uh, the patient presence with the loss of hair over the dorsum of the foot and also there will be a dependent rubber is seen and always remember whenever you are assessing the diabetic patient always check for the bilateral ischemities. And next one is the palpation segment and uh, feel for the whether foot is warm or the cold and examine the peripheral pulsations like the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial and the femoral artery palpated for the presence of the breads and the plantar aspects for the presence of any bony prominences in this usually uh, the dorsalis pedis uh, will be palpated lateral to the extensor hallucis longus and whereas the posterior tibial tree is uh, palpated above and behind the medial malleolus. And the examination of footwear which is very very important in this uh, early screening of the diabetic foot ulcer and the patient should not be using the ill-fitting or the tight uh, shoes and always inspect for the signs of the wear and tear of the outsole of the shoes and it should not have a protruding objects inside you can see in the picture the how the foot there is very badly deformed in the patient with the diabetes mellitus and if there is no correct fitting of the shoes it can lead to the development of the bony changes and the presence of more increase in the pressures in the plantar area and in the neurological assessment mainly we will be focusing on the small nerve fibers and the large nerve fibers if the patient is developed uh, involved in the small nerve fibers there will be a decrease in the thermal sensation that is a warm and cold perception may not be felt by the patient and the pinprick sensation that is a pain and the sweating source whereas in the large nerve fibers the vibration perception threshold 
is reduced and the touch sensation is also reduced to position sense and the deep tendon reflexes and the motor nerves are also reduced in in this uh, neurological assessment uh, if we are testing on the clinical field uh, if we don't have we have certain devices to measure uh, and assess the level of this involvement so the testing with monofilament usually is mainly tested for the touch sensation that is the semis we steam uh, nylon monofilament of size 5.07 thickness equivalent to the 10 grams of liner force should be used to check with the patient whether having the touch sensation or, or not it is highly predictive if uh, subsequent ulceration you have to place this on the foot area and ask the patient to identify whether he can able to feel the touch or not and it should be tested on the bilateral areas if the if the patient is able to appreciate more than three points then there is a touch sensation intact if patient is not able to identify the touch sensation then we have to further do further screening assessment if in case if we don't have the monofilament to test we can do this alternately by using the cotton wool for the light touch these are the main uh, this picture shows with how uh, the two, uh, monofilament is being uh, tested applied it is applied perpendicular to the foot uh, and it buckles at the given force of the 10 grams and the patient should be able to sense the monofilament by the time it buckles and also identify the site during this testing time we have to ask the patient to close the eyes and the patient will be at in a sitting position, a long sitting position, and should be relaxed. So this first the demonstrated at the proximal side and then at the foot. And usually 10 sites are used, and areas of the callus should be avoided because already there is a thick uh, skin over there. So it's always better to avoid in the callus area. And inability of this uh, sensations may feel to indicate the loss of protective sensation. And the next one is the biothesiometry, that is the vibration perception threshold. Uh, mainly, uh, the position of the patient is on long sitting position on the supine line. And the, the device in the picture, you can see it has a head, the stylus of the device, which is placed over the dorsal hallux. And the amplitude should be slowly increased until the patient detects the vibration sense. So that head uh, on the machine, you can increase the uh, threshold and the speed or the vibration will also increase. So in that situation, if patient is able to feel, we have to record at what level the person has identified or the sense the vibration threshold. So this is resulting in the vibration perception threshold. So first it is demonstrated over the proximal side. The mean of the three readings uh, over the heat salad should be taken. If VPT is more than 25 volts, this vibration perception threshold is uh, emitted in the volts. And if it is more than 25 volts, it is abnormal and indicative of subsequent alteration. If it is less than 20, it is said to be, it is intact. And if it is somewhere between the 25 to uh, 30, it is a mild neuropathy. If it is between the 30 to 38, it is moderate neuropathy. And if it is the patient is uh, with 39 volts, more than 39 volts, it is said to be the severe neuropathy changes. And if if he don't have the uh, VPT machine with us to do this, then we can use alternatively a 128 hertz tuning fork for the vibration sense. And next one is the deep tendon reflexes, that is the superficial and the deep reflexes. Uh, mainly, the, we will be checking for the plantar response and as well as for the deep tendon reflexes, mainly we will perform the knee and the ankle reflexes. And the next one is a vascular assessment, which is very, very important in uh, ruling out uh, the vascular involvement. Mainly, the pulses, uh, the dorsalis pedis, and the posterior tibial artery will be checked. And the capillary refill time also will be noted and the claudication distance the patient will, uh, will be asked to walk and uh, note the time uh, and the distance where he develops the pain for this we have a thermography device which will assess for the vasculation patency and circulation through temperature distribution over the foot area and also we have the handle thermometer which with which where we will be comparing on the both sides and difference should not be more than 2.2 degrees celsius 
In this, uh, along with this uh, thermography, also we have uh, AB and DBI testing, mainly the ankle brachial index. Uh, this is mainly uh, done recording the uh, blood pressure at the level of the ankle, ankle systolic pressure to the brachial systolic pressure. Normally, the ABI values should be ranged between the 0.9 to 1.1. If the ABI value is more than 1.1, it can be considered as the involvement of the microvascular problem. And if it is 0.9, less than 0.9, it can be involvement of the microvessel pathology. Absent or the feeble pulses with ABI less than 0.9 confirms the presence of the ischemic changes. And also, if the ABI value more than 1.2, then we can see that the calcification of the arteries and the next one is the musculoskeletal assessment mainly we will be evaluating for the gross deformities the common forefoot deformities are the cloto and the hamoto the cloto mainly the meta mpp joint hyperextension and ip joint flexion will be seen and whereas in the hamoto that is the distal phalangeal extension and also along with this the charcoal orthopathy also can be seen in the, as a, one of the musculoskeletal complications. This mainly occurs in the neuropathic foot and the midfoot usually is affected. This is a unilateral which is painless and also by looking it has a reddish in color and a hot when it is palpated and swollen in the flat foot and the profound deformity. So this charcot orthopathy mainly presents with the deformities, mainly is a rocker bottom deformity and also there is a midfoot ulceration in the charcot foot. So for this kind of patients, we have a other uh, footwear devices for this rocker bottom deformity. So this is mainly this uh, charcot orthopathy mainly because of the development of this diabetic sensory neuropathy where the patients will develop a loss of protective sensation and always upon the repeated micro trauma and uh, which will lead to the increase in local blood flow and further leads to the development of the bone resorption, micro fractures and ultimately lead to the development of this charcoal foot. Now next one we will be looking for the testing for the high pressure points. Mainly it can be done by the impact methods, the static foot scanners and the dynamic foot scanners. This ink mat is, uh, which is very cost effective and it can be done at any field or at the, the patient site. It does not require much uh, equipment. The patient is simply asked to stand or walk on the mat and the ink is applied on the other side of the mat with the roller. You can see in the picture, the darker area uh, represents the higher pressure points. And whereas this is a static foot scanner, you can see uh, on the left side and on the right side that is giving the image, the computer image, where uh, the reddish color gives the excessive amount of the uh, pressure is being bared. Along, along with this, we also have the dynamic foot scanner, mainly it uh, calculates the gait parameters of the spatial and temporal gait parameters, where completely the analysis can be done. So this will tell us about the, again, how bad the biomechanical changes is being affected in the patient's foot and which can lead to the diabetic ulcers. And next one, we will be focusing on the screening questionnaires, the mainly focusing on the neuropathic specific, that is uh, Michigan Neuropathy uh, Screening Instrument, MNSI, and the Neuropathic Disability Score, NDS, and Diabetic Neuropathy Symptom Score, DNS. So these are the three common neuropathy uh, questionnaires which can be uh, used in our routine clinical practice. And the self-management, mainly the summary of the diabetic self-care activities need to be recorded. And also the quality of life scale for these diabetic patients mainly will be using the diabetic foot ulcer scale and the neuropathy and foot ulcer specific quality of life uh, questionnaire also can be administered. And next one is the wound assessment, mainly the wound care education. Uh, we have to focus in suit wound assessment. The Bates and Jensen wound assessment tool uh, can be instrumental in using this wound assessment and also can be performed uh, with the autocad analysis of the wound assessment and also the 3D modeling of the wound. 
So the management mainly it's an interdisciplinary team, a diabetic foot care team. Mainly it involves the surgeons, nurse, orthotist, the patient related, the podiatrist, educator or social worker, diabetologist, and the physiotherapist. So the management mainly is categorized into the preventive and the therapeutic. In the preventive, always advice to give the foot care. Advice can be given to the patient, the do's and don'ts on the checklist. Uh, the frequent screening uh, should be done by a specialist and the physician. And always it is advisable to prescribe the preventive footwear uh, for not developing uh, ulcers. And also the good nutrition and diet advice also to be encouraged to this patients. Uh, to have a good glycemic control and always encourage the patient to do some sort of regular physical activity and exercises in order to keep the fit and the, improve the blood sugar levels. Whereas the therapeutic medical management if uh, depends upon the level of the patient uh, infection and this and the physiotherapy management for ulcer cases. So this is a foot risk classification uh, based on the risk uh, category. If the patient with the risk group uh, zero, that is a no loss of protective sensation or no peripheral arterial in, uh, disease involvement, the treatment recommendations could be focused on the patient education and the follow-up for these patients can be uh, yearly once. And whereas the patients with the risk group one, that is a loss of protective sensation uh, plus uh, with or without deformity, uh, the treatment recommendations mainly focusing on the considering the prescriptive and accommodative footwear, and also consider the prophylactic surgery if deformity is not able to safely accommodated in the shoes and also advise uh, continue the patient education of the diabetic care and the follow-up for this uh, category of patients that is every three to six months should be done by the diabetologist or the physician and whereas uh, the risk category with the two that is uh, peripheral arterial disease with or without the loss of protective sensation the treatment recommendations mainly we have to focus again like as the earlier uh, risk category to consider the prescriptive and accommodative footwear and consider the vascular consultation for combined follow-up because of the peripheral arterial involvement and then these patients are advised to follow up every two to three months by the consultant and whereas the third uh, risk group category, uh, the patients who are having a history of ulcer or uh, recent amputation, uh, patient requires to have the patient education and uh, given the prescriptive of the accommodative footwear and consider the vascular consultations for combined follow up if the patient is having the vascular issues that is the peripheral arterial disease involvement and the follow up is mainly every one to two months. Uh, this is a top 10 commandments given by the diabetic manual. Uh, we have to always uh, insist or instruct the diabetes patients that they should never apply heat or any kind of other materials to the feet area and never soak the feet completely. And always ask, insist the patients to keep nails clean and cut and never wear ill-fitting shoes, never go with the barefoot, uh, never assume that sensation or circulation is normal in the feet. Never use unprescribed medicines on the feet. Carefully check for the presence of calluses or the corns and a quickly report, self-report can be given. And also never uh, perform the bathroom surgeries on your feet. Usually all the patients, uh, elderly people, they do some of their own uh, techniques and they end up with the development of this ulcers. And also we should ask the patient to never keep the feet too moist or to dry. Usually in this patient with the diabetic neuropathy, they will be having the loss of sensation, numbness, tingling and all. So identifying this problems at the initial stages is always uh, important. If it is not addressed at initial stages, it will lead to the development of this foot ulcers. And the footwear uh, mainly is one of the important uh, prescriptive uh, measurements which will be given to these patients. Uh, the footwear should always have a broad toe box and the heel height should be of uh, five centimeters or lesser than that and the stiff heel counter uh, mainly this heel counter uh, stiff mainly to prevent the excessive movement of the foot within the shoes and also the footwear which upper uh, should have the soft lining and the soft insole shoes or sandals with velcros and heel counter preferred is always advisable for the patients chappals with grip between the greater toe and the second toe are not encouraged 
as they have the weak muscles so the recommendations as we discussed uh, for the various risk categories in this the risk category zero always shoes over the counter and the sport shoes for the brisk walking if patients are required to go uh, if patients are doing the exercise as a brisk walking they are encouraged to use the sport shoes and the patients who are with the risk category one always give the soft cushion sport shoes and to prevent the shoes with the velcro avoid slippers high heeled stilettos and the narrow toe walks and the patients with the risk category 2 mainly focus on the shoes with the elastic uh, upper shoes with an extra depth high toe box and the soft insoles and the patients with the risk category 3 the preventive footwear should be given the custom molded shoes and insoles based upon the problem of the patient based upon the assessment uh, of the foot we have to divide, uh, divide uh, we have to give to the patient a individual custom tailored footwear foot device and the four foot relief shoes especially if the person is having any four foot ulcers so in order to avoid the more pressure on that area we have to offload the four foot area and also the shoes with ankle support and a filler for amputated portion for the partial foot amputees patient should be increased these are the uh, footwears need to be avoided for the diabetic uh, Uh, neuropathy patients uh, who are especially prone to develop the ulcers so the medical therapeutic management mainly uh, the patients with the diabetic ulcers uh, will be focusing on the wound debridement revascularization surgery amputation and uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy i'm not going in much detail all these things along with this we also have the newer therapies that is the platelet derived growth factor a uh, dermograph apigraph and a half and a granulocytic colony stimulating a uh, growth factor so these are the apigraph are nothing but it's a skin substitute uh, bioengineered with uh, living cells which mainly helps in uh, transforming the wounds from chronic to the acute uh, stages and it, it heals the diabetic foot ulcers very faster whereas this hyaf therapy is also produced by a biotechnological process of the esterification of the hyaluronic acid with the benzoyl alcohol so these are the advanced uh, treatment methods uh, if all the preventive measures fail then the patient will be uh, treated with this therapies we have a nice uh, foot care guideline uh, for uh, patients with this diabetes and uh, diabetic foot ulcers this i will share the article uh, later for your reading and the physiotherapy management mainly we will be focusing on the electrotherapeutic usage of the electrotherapeutic modalities and uh, exercise uh, recommendations mainly uh, we are uh, the main keys to prevent this diabetic foot ulcers are by providing the protective footwear the foot skin and the toenail care and the patient education which is very very important in management of this diabetes so the electrotherapeutic management mainly we have the electric currents uh, that is uh, the let uh, research uh, literature says that high voltage pulse galvanic electrical stimulation enhances the wound healing when it is used with conjunction with the appropriate offloading and local wound care this high voltage uh, pulsed currents uh, that is mainly the 100 microseconds with 150 volts of 100 hertz for 45 minutes three times weekly for four weeks accelerates the wound closure for chronic leg ulcers and whereas uh, we have the laser or the photobiomodulation therapy that is the helium neon based laser therapy of uh, 630 to 0.8 nanometer wavelength uh, at a dose of uh, 4.8 joules per centimeter square for 5 days uh, a week it promotes a tissue repair process of the diabetic wounds uh, which the study was done in the diabetic rats and this a uh, diabetic wounded cells responds in a dose and the wavelength dependent manner to the laser light in which these cells are responded the best when irradiated with the fluence of 5 joules per centimeter square at a wavelength of 632.8 nanometers along with this we have other various electrophysical therapy modalities like electrical stimulation low level laser therapy therapeutic ultrasound and electromagnetic therapy which always helps in healing the ulcers and the exercise recommendations for the patients with uh, diabetes mellitus are the aerobic exercises with a frequency of 3 to 5 days per week with an intensity of 40 to 60% of the vo2 max 
uh, with the duration of minimum 150 minutes per week. And the mode of this uh, aerobic exercises uh, mainly involving in the larger group muscles walking. And the exercises prescribed based on the uh, patient's criteria. And whereas the resistance exercises frequencies are ranging from two to three days per week with an intensity of 50% of the one repeated maximum with the duration of uh, three to five sets with each set of eight to 10 repetitions. The mode of resistance exercises can be given by the free weights and the machines. We have to be very careful uh, whenever we are prescribing the exercises uh, for uh, diabetic uh, peripheral neuropathy patients. It's always uh, not, uh, it should be done under the supervision of a therapist. Exercise and this diabetic foot, uh, mainly the long-term aerobic exercise training, that is the supervised exercise training, four hours per week of uh, on the brisk walking on a treadmill at a 52% to 85% of the heart rate reserve can prevent the onset or modify the natural history of diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And whereas the combination therapy of the alpha lipoic acid and the backward walking proved to be more effective than the alpha lipoic acid alone in reducing the plantar pressures in patients with diabetic neuropathy. And the other one more uh, therapy uh, which is used for this diabetic uh, ulcer people, mainly the vacuum compression therapy uh, with the conventional uh, therapy is more effectively healed diabetic foot ulcers than the conventional therapy alone. This vacuum therapy effectively prompted the capillary filling and therefore it helped in patients with the arterial circulation problems. This was the study done by uh, myself and uh, my team back uh, during in my uh, PhD time. Mainly the photobiomodulation therapy of the uh, uh, as given along with the other conventional therapies in this neuroistemic diabetic foot ulcers. I mean, you can see the image uh, of a patient who is having this neuroistemic uh, ulcer foot uh, and also having the deformity. In the C, uh, picture C, you can see that is the foot offloading device where we have given uh, completely the hind foot offloading foot where completely we have relieved the uh, pressure over that area for promotion of the wound healing. So this is the pictures you can see uh, where the ulcer area has been irradiated with the uh, laser therapy with the earlier I mentioned the wavelength and frequency. You can see the wound completing healing closure from the A picture to the B picture. It's almost all took uh, two months to completely heal. The patient has come daily to the clinic and undergone this laser therapy along with some exercises. So these are my references. To summarize, uh, mainly uh, today's session, early as a physiotherapist, we also have a uh, important role in uh, identifying these problems, mainly the early assessment, early screening and early identification of the problems uh, in people with diabetes mellitus can uh, result in, uh, you know, not uh, going for the amputation. We can prevent the foot ulcers by doing early screening and identification. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sampa, for this amazing conference. We have now some questions. Okay. Um, Deborah Shafik, Shafik asked, what is the greatest difficulty in treating diabetes patients, patients with food ulcers? And what's the uh, best way to rehabilitate them? Okay. I can, uh, based upon my clinical experience back when I worked in India, one of the major problems is the social stigma and uh, even the transportation for the patients. And especially in India, in the Asian continent, there are uh, elderly people who develop this diabetic neuropathy. They walk with the barefoot because of their customs and traditions. That is one of the major uh, risk factors which we have found in our clinical practice. Of course, yes, patient self-education and uh, regular counseling can help in preventing this foot ulcers. Okay. Professor Arthur Haskins, 
what are the challenges to engage people with food users due to diabetes in exercise programs targeting the lower needs? As I said, yes, again, the cost is one of the thing and uh, adherence to the exercises. We cannot, uh, if we look at the background of the patients, diabetic patients, they sometimes they may not able to afford the clinical visit charges. So in that cases, we always uh, give them some patient handouts or the manual and uh, we ask them to do these exercises back at home. Initially, we will be supervising for first 10 sessions and later we will ask them to do it at the home. But yes, sometimes adherence is one of the problem. We don't know whether they are doing or not. Okay. And what do you think about multidisciplinary treatment of patients with diabetic food, especially psychology, concerning well-being and quality of life? What is the greatest difficulty between diabetic patients? Uh, Dr. Petrosha, can you repeat it again? What do you think about your psychologist during treatment? Psychologist. Yes, during treatment. Yes, counseling, counseling always matters. Well-being and quality of life. Yes, always it matters. As I said, uh, always the diabetic uh, rehabilitation should focus on an interdisciplinary team uh, where we have to send the patients to the psychologist for further counseling and to help them. Sometimes patients who are with amputees, they already will be in a state of depression and further they will try to avoid for the visits to the clinics. So in such situations, always it's good to give them a counseling and to address the main issues. And what kind or or what type of care should a person with diabetes foot have should have when exercising? Sorry. What kind? What care should a person with diabetes foot should have when ex, when exercising? Exercising. Yes. Exercising, yes. Always, uh, as I mentioned, if the patient is having the diabetic peripheral neuropathy, we have to check for the sensation levels. If patient is not having sensations, it is not advisable for that patient to do exercises without supervision. In such cases, we can give the mild uh, brisk walking exercises that too with the customized footwear uh, prescription. Okay. Any questions? Do you have some questions? No? I hope I try to summarize as we know that this is a very vague topic. I try to summarize all the points. Yes, it was perfect, Dr. Sampa. We really enjoy it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, thanks again for sharing your precious time with us, Dr. Sampa. We really enjoyed this moment. It has been a big pleasure to have you with us in our program. Uh, as I, I have already said, we are very excited. We are very happy about your project. And we... Uh, we yes, well, and, uh, yes, I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Arun Maya, in this regard because uh, he is one of the pioneer, leading pioneer in this diabetic foot area where I had a privilege to be his student during my uh, doctoral studies and these all things we have learned through him. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks, I would like to thank Dr. Arl <laughs> also. Okay, bom pessoal, uh, se ninguém mais tem alguma pergunta, nós vamos então encerrar a, a nossa sessão. Lembrando que nós temos a Semana da Saúde da Unisua até sexta-feira. Na sexta-feira, no dia 14, nós teremos o Simpósio para Desportivo Carioca, a quinta edição, esse ano de forma remota. Né? Então, o um evento tradicional do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciências da Reabilitação. Nossa primeira edição foi em 2015. Né? Então, esse ano, na, na quinta 
na quinta edição. Então, nós esperamos vocês também na próxima sexta-feira. Os links estão disponibilizados nas mídias sociais né, da, da Uniswam. Uh, se vocês quiserem conhecer um pouco mais sobre o nosso programa de mestrado, doutorado, pós-doutorado, os links estão na, na descrição. Lembrando que o nosso programa em Ciências da Reabilitação é o único no, no Rio de Janeiro, nessa área. Nós tivemos início em 2009, aprovação pela CAP em 2009. Mais recentemente, em 2015, tivemos a, a, a aprovação do doutorado. E, uh, ultimamente, temos recebido muitos estudantes, muitos pesquisadores de pós-doutorado, também internacionais, né? o, o, o doutor Sampa ele é o nosso uh, quarto, quarto... Doutor, I would like to add, uh, reply to one comment raised by uh, Julia Fernanda, that, uh, yes, uh, we do have some educational, we have developed uh, an educational, institutional education materials for the patient education in this type 2 diabetes mellitus patients. We do have, uh, later, uh, with my professor permission, I would like to share those things in later stages. You can circulate it to the... Ok, thank you, Sampa. Então, Julia, Julia, nossa aluna de doutorado perguntou, desculpa, eu acabei passando essa pergunta, então eles também têm programas lá na, na instituição, em termos de educação, né, em termos de educação sobre é, o pé diabético. Então, uh, então o, 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 o doutor Sampa, ele é o nosso quarto pesquisador de pós-doutorado internacional, né, no nosso programa, ele vai trabalhar com o efeito de treinamento, diferentes tipos de treinamento, né, treinamento aeróbio, treinamento intervalado de alta intensidade, treinamento de força em desfechos relacionados à saúde, como capacidade funcional, estresse é, oxidativo, composição corporal de pacientes com diabetes tipo 2. Enquanto o projeto não é aprovado pelo Comitê de Ética, nós estamos com essas sessões. E, mensalmente, o doutor Sampa traz alguma, algum tópico relevante, algum tópico atual sobre diabetes. E nós vamos, então, continuar divulgando para no próximo mês, quem tiver o interesse, acompanhar. O, o nosso trabalho. Ok, pessoal? Então, muito obrigada pela participação de todos. Espero, espero que vocês tenham um bom dia. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sampa. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, once again. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, looking, looking forward to have many more discussions on this area in future. Oh, ok. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Tchau, tchau. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Dr. Arthur.